Hello, Woodman. We are so excited you've decided to join us today. We know that many of you aren't able to attend in person for a variety of reasons, whether it's because of health, travel, or perhaps you're outside of the country right now. We pray that you will find encouragement, hope, and healing through our time in worship and learning from God's word today. We have a beautiful time of worship ahead of us, and we are also starting our four-part Easter series, Friend, King, Lamb, and Lord, where we will look at who Jesus is and his relationship with us in those roles. Speaking of Easter, it's only a couple weeks away. Easter is an exciting time at Whitman. We are looking forward to gathering with our family, friends, and neighbors on the weekend of April 17th to celebrate Christ's resurrection on Easter and the hope and eternal life we have in him. We hope that you will be able to make plans and be expectant with us as we pray for what God will do in those services. Another thing we hope you'll consider is joining our serving teams. We expect to have thousands of local guests visit our campuses for the first time, and it takes hundreds of us to host them. I wonder if you would consider serving at a service and attending a service. Many families make this a yearly tradition, and we hope you'll join in as well. If you're new to Woodman and want to find out more information about our mission and our values, or perhaps you want to get more connected, we'd love for you to join one of our in-person Woodman welcomes at your local campus where you can meet some of our staff and have any questions you might have answered. You can find out information on the next Woodman Welcome and information on attending and serving at one of our Easter services in our online service guide. As we head into worship, join us in lifting high the name of Jesus. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaking, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. Cause he's never let me down. He's faithful. So why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going under. I'm not held. Oh, okay. 
When I think about um, Jesus being my friend, I just think knowing that even as like friends change and jobs change, he'll always be consistent, he'll never leave. Well, knowing what Jesus experienced from skepticism in his hometown to being rejected by his closest friends, I mean, he's been through all of that and he never sinned. And so I know I can lean on him during those times to, to be my friend and, and support me. I don't have to be in a good mood. I don't have to say the right words. Jesus just listens to me. I mean, he knows my heart. And I've learned, I'm learning as a friend to others to, to listen, to be fully present when I'm engaging with people. One of the ways that Jesus has been a friend to me and has, I think, asked me to be a friend to others is through community group. We really want our community group to be a place where the people who are in the community group feel Jesus' presence. When I was 21 years old, my mom died suddenly of a massive heart attack. And I was a senior in college with just a couple of months to go. And it was very difficult to have to go back to school and finish up during that time. And he was the only one who was there with me to encourage my heart. I've been through a lot, uh, one of which was my parents' divorce. Um, I didn't know Jesus at the time, so I felt really alone. And it was through that divorce where I met my stepmom and her kids. Um, their faith was so strong, and they ultimately led me to Christ and the best friend I've ever had. Well, hello, Woodman. It is good to be back. If you are new with us or perhaps joining us online for the first time, my name is Josh. I'm, I'm one of the pastors here, uh, but I've been out of town. I began with a little, little downtime with the fam for spring break. And then this past weekend when uh, Tim was delivering that stellar message, I don't know if you got to hear that, but, but check it out if you didn't. Uh, we were with some, some of our friends at a Cure. Uh, Cure is one of our global partners doing medical missions throughout Africa and in the Philippines. And, and I left that with a, a full heart and, and I will say a little measure of redeemed pride as I thought about the way that you've contributed to that work. Many of you have gone and served at hospitals. And it was awesome to just hear firsthand of all that God's doing in and through them. But as much fun as it is to get away, there's no place like home. And I'm happy to be with you guys. You know, we can be described in a variety of different ways, right? We can be described by what we do vocationally. Might say that, you know, he's a nurse or uh, she's a stay-at-home mom. We can be described by where we live. I mean, they're in Briar Gate or they live up in Monument. We can be described by more weighty things. We might say that, you know, he is healthy and, and he's stable or, or the opposite, she, she loves cats. We can be described, we can be described in a variety of ways. And one of the ways I think a lot of us have been described by others is as a friend. And you may not think about it much, but that is something that you share with Jesus. Jesus was called a friend. What was surprising is he was called a friend of sinners, which is not something you would necessarily think the Son of God would be into. But in addition to being called a friend, Jesus is called things that we are not. Uh, he is called king in that God gave to him the throne of his father David. He is called the lamb, the lamb that was slain for the forgiveness of our sins. He is called Lord in that one day, every knee and every tongue, every knee will bow, every tongue confessed that Christ is Lord. And in the weeks ahead, before Easter, 
Uh, We are going to look at each of these descriptions of Jesus through four little vignettes found in the Gospel of Luke. And the passage before us this weekend is an important one, and for a couple reasons. First, it contains what is arguably the most important verse in Luke. That is Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And then for us, more pointedly as a church, uh, it's this passage we're going to look at from which we developed our church vision statement, to love well, change lives through Christ. This was actually the first passage I ever preached as one of the pastors here. Uh, But seven years ago, I didn't have a lot of pull, I didn't get a lot of time, it was a rather cursory look at the text. This weekend, we're going to take a deeper dive and do a more extensive study. But as we jump into it, what I want us to keep in mind is that verse, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. It's not just something we're to remember come Easter time. It's something that you and I as followers of Christ are called to participate in each and every day that he gives us. So that's my prayer. That's where we're headed. If you would, let's ask God to meet with us. Heavenly Father, it's been a little nutty just for me and my own spirit to be celebrating what you're doing around the world through partners such as Cure and at the same time to have this dissonance in my spirit to think of those in Ukraine. God, we come to you by faith. We confess that you are the Lord, that you are the sovereign. And even when what you do does not make sense, we we come together to choose faith. Lord, I thank you that you sent your son Jesus Christ to look for me. I thank you that you sent him to seek and to save the lost. And so, Father, I pray that you would well up in us just the same kind of passion for those that don't know you in our own circles. And perhaps for those who are here or listening to my voice, God, that don't know you, would they recognize that you may have come, sent your son 2,000 years ago, but we today were on your mind. And so, God, meet with us. Help me not to make any mistakes. I'm rather rusty. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you have a Bible, uh, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 19. We're going to be beginning at verse 1. And to get you up to speed, uh, Jesus has just told his disciples for at least the third time, the third recorded time anyways, that he was going up to Jerusalem to be crucified, uh, to be beaten, to be mocked, and to be killed. And we pick up the narrative as Jesus is making his final approach. He is headed to Jerusalem to be killed. And this, what we're going to look at, is the last personal encounter between Jesus and an individual before his crucifixion. And from it, we get our call to love well. Uh, We desire like Christ, to love well. Now, if you are new to this stuff, (laughs) I want to just clarify, because in our culture, we tend to use the word love sometimes loosely. I could truthfully tell you that I I love the Green Bay Packers, I love the Toronto Maple Leafs, I love red meat, and I love my wife. And you would be thinking to yourself, that's all well and good, But one of those things should not be like the others, right? (laughs) Hopefully when he uses that word, he would use it differently with Kimberly than he would with the Packers. Now, biblical love, described in Scripture, is is of a much more substantive measure than, than we sometimes throw it around. Biblically, love is is to be sacrificial. 
John 15, 13 says, greater love is no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. I mean, I love the Green Bay Packers, but I'm not taking a bullet for them. I would for my wife. What really sets Jesus apart is who he will show that kind of love to. Jesus loves well, and it begins with an unlikely recipient. Look at verse 1. He, that's Jesus, <clears throat> entered Jericho and was passing through. He's passing through on his way to Jerusalem. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. Jesus is, is walking through Jerusalem, on his, uh, walking through Jericho, on his way to Jerusalem, on his way to his death. And Luke says, behold, <laughs> Behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, a chief tax collector who was rich. Now, just as today, if you work for the IRS, you might kind of keep that quiet at a dinner party. You know, like, just, I'm in accounting. <laughs> so too back then, but even more so, tax collectors were despised. The Romans had created a rather brilliant scheme as it related to the collection of taxes. Uh, they would sell an area or a region to an individual or to a group. And so the win for the Romans is, I mean, their overhead was rather low. And they could depend upon a fixed amount because they would sell that region. Now, the tax collector or tax collector group that bought that region would make their money by charging more than they had to pay the Romans. That's how they got paid. And depending on the tax collector's scruples, or lack thereof, it could be a very lucrative endeavor. And Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus was a man who was good at what he did. Luke calls him a chief tax collector. And what makes that hard is that nowhere else in the New Testament do we see that term. And actually, you don't even see it in Greek literature until the fourth century. So we are a little bit like, what specifically does it mean? A lot of commentators think that it probably means that Zacchaeus Zacchaeus was at the top of like the tax pyramid, that he probably had other guys collecting taxes, bringing it to him, he would take a cut. He was like the dawn of tax collection in the Jericho region. Uh, Jericho being one of the major trade thoroughfares. What was worse though, is that since tax collectors made their money uh, from pilfering their countrymen and giving it to the Romans, uh, they were also considered to be traitors to Israel. So if you're a note taker, you could just circle Zacchaeus' name and just put in the margin, not invited to the reindeer games. You know what I mean? Zacchaeus never heard of a birthday and then ran to his mailbox to see if he got the invitation. Zacchaeus was a traitor as far as his country people considered. And what's more than that is if we had started this study back in Luke chapter 18, just one chapter before, we would have read how Jesus said it was so difficult for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. So much so, Jesus equated it to, so he, he said it would be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, play that through, than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. So this does not bode well for Zach. He's a rich traitor, despised by his people, whom Jesus says, because you're rich, it's going to be super hard for you. 
And yet, for reasons we are not told, Zacchaeus is interested in Jesus. Verse 3 says, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on, the count, on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he, Jesus, was about to pass that way. We don't know why, but Zacchaeus was interested. You know, it could have been just sort of surfacey. He, he had heard that Jesus you know, does all these miracles, and he thought, like, that would be cool. I don't have anything on the count. I'm going to go check that out. It could be that Zacchaeus had heard that a tax collector, Matthew, formerly known as the tax collector, that a former tax collector was among Jesus' disciples, and maybe Zach's like that. I want to check that out. It, it could actually be given the relatively small number of tax collectors? Maybe Zacchaeus knew Matthew. Maybe he had heard the story of, of, of Matthew leaving everything and following after Jesus, and, and, and maybe Zach's like, I, I gotta see. I gotta see this Jesus guy. But, but he couldn't because, because the crowd blocked his view. And, and Luke says on, on account of, uh, 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 of Zach's height. Now, it's, it's rather unfortunate for Zacchaeus. And, and if you grew up in Sunday school, like you sing that, like that song, which is not terribly uplifting for the poor guy, you know, and, and, and then, I mean, if you grew up in the church, you might very well think like he was a hobbit, you know, like... Luke's just saying uh, he wasn't as tall as the other people and he just physically could not see over the crowd. But while short, he was determined. He considered the route that like Jesus was taking, how, how he was going down, and, and Zacchaeus thought to himself, I I'm going to get ahead of it. And, but but as, as he runs, it says, as he runs, he recognizes the people are going to follow. And so he climbs up into a sycamore tree, which is why I think the story has for generations let itself, lent itself right to kids, because, I mean, kids like climbing trees. But, but don't you, <laughs> right now, you know, have, think back to your fond memories of when you were a kid and you climbed the tree and all that time I broke my arm and I just, we would just spend hours climbing the tree. This is not like that. In New Testament Israel, grown men did not climb trees. In New Testament Israel, grown men did not run. But Zach didn't care. He realizes that he will not get line of sight. And so he runs and climbs a tree. Very, very unusual and embarrassing for the thing of his for a man of his standing, chief tax collector to do. But he did. Zacchaeus was interested in Christ. What's more, Jesus, Jesus was interested in Zacchaeus. Look at verse 5. It says, and when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, 
Hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. The sycamore tree would have had these huge leaves, right? So maybe Zacchaeus thought that, like, if I get ahead, I'm going to run ahead. I'm going to climb the tree, and I'll have some cover. No one's going to see me. And as he could see the crowd coming through, who knows? He's, you know, lighting up a cigarette. He's just, I'm just going to, out of sight, out of mind. I'm going to catch my glimpse. I'm going to see him. And then it must have been just a little bit electric to watch it, like, Jesus. He's like, coming right, coming right to me. And maybe Zacchaeus tucks the flask away, and then he's like, okay, this is seriously freaking me out. He's coming right to the tree. And he stops under it. And he looks up. And Jesus calls him by name. And he says, hurry up and come down. For I must stay at your house today. Now, people like to geek out a little bit on, on, and, and, and kind of ask, well, how was it just that Jesus knew Zacchaeus' name? To which I, as not really a complex individual, he's the son of God. So, like, he's got a lot of stuff up his sleeve. You know what I mean? Like, like Jesus knowing Zacchaeus' name does, does not wig me out, does not cause me much concern. What I do find profound. Do you know that this is the only time recorded in any of the Gospels that Jesus invited himself to somebody's house? You say, I've read like tons of times about Jesus, like reclining at table with people, Jesus eating with people. Yep. Say, Jesus was at Peter's house. Yep. Jesus was in a lot of homes. But in each and every case, Jesus had been invited in. This was the only time that Jesus invited himself. Standing under a tree, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. I must stay at your house today. Lest we forget Jesus' earthly ministry is on the clock. Now, for reasons I don't terribly understand, right? Like Jesus kept telling the disciples, and yet it's just they could not, it did not compute. They, they just still were not cluing in to what Jesus was telling them. Jesus is like, we're going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be crucified. And they're talking about their favorite falafel place. He's like, do you, do, are you listening to what I'm saying? So here Jesus, days away, from being beaten, from being mocked, from being crucified upon the cross. And he's like, before that goes down, I must, I must be with Zacchaeus. Today. I must be with a rich tax collector considered a traitor by his nation. I must today be with an individual who works for the people who are going to crucify me. I must today Be with you. If people were shocked at Jesus' interest, they per- maybe had no category for Zacchaeus' response. He, he's the most unlikely person. And his response is unexpected. Look at verse 6. It says, so he hurried, 
he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. Now, if you were with us on Christmas Eve, I don't know if you were. You were here. I know that. If you're with us on Christmas Eve, you were here too. I heard you laugh. It's, you're in there too. If you, if you were with us on Christmas Eve, you're like, this sounds a little familiar. Do you know that Luke uses these same Greek words to describe what the shepherds did a- after they announced the birth of Jesus to him? And this guy up in the tree just trying to get a glimpse of Jesus. Jesus stands below him and says, you, Zacchaeus, you come down. I got to be at your house today. And Zacchaeus is all about it. Zacchaeus responds immediately with haste and joy. It's his best day ever. And consider for a moment, if the crowds had had their way, it never would have happened. It was not simply that Zacchaeus could not see over the crowds. It was that the crowds would not let him through so that he could. They were blocking him on purpose. I mean, if one's height was the only issue, no kid would ever have seen a parade. You know what I mean? Like, like it, their kids are generally not as tall as us. But what's one thing parades have in common when you, when, when you watch it on television, you're there. There's always seemingly just a line of little ones in the front. Because the parents are there. I'm not here for myself. I want my kid to see the stupid parade. So all the grown-ups, all, sorry if parades are your thing. I don't mean it like insulting. <laughs> They're fun. The grown-ups want the kids to see. And, and you and I do this, right, even if it's not your kid, right? You're like, oh, look, get in here, you little guy. Oh, come on. Why? Because it's, it's for them. So the crowd parts ways to let the children in. The crowd did not want Zacchaeus in. And this is crack packing, admittedly. I don't want to be, doesn't say this in the Bible. So I'm treading lightly. But interpretation through voting, which is also not a great thing to do. Who thinks this was probably not the first time Zacchaeus had encountered this kind of thing? You got to think when he's trying to get bananas, when when he's looking for a parking spot, you got to think that Zacchaeus was used to people hating him. The thing that we have to wrap our heads around is that more often, I think, than not, those that we may conclude to be the least interested in Jesus could very well be the ones who want to see him the most. And maybe it's because I've been gone and I'm just a bit spicy. I will tell you, Jesus, Jesus is legit angry if we get in their way. In Matthew 18, now Jesus was asked, he's hanging out with disciples and people, right? Jesus asked, who's the greatest in your kingdom? They always want, who's the greatest? Who's the greatest? And Jesus grabbed a child. I don't think forcibly, but he was like, come here. He takes a kid to himself. And he says, if anyone wants to come in my kingdom, they got to be like this one right here. 
And don't misunderstand that Jesus is not calling for some like infantile faith. But he's using a child as an example and a thing kids have in common. They're not good at caring for stuff, right? They're dependent on someone else. In humility, they have to trust mom and dad. They can't just walk out on a Thursday afternoon and say, I'm just doing this by myself. Jesus is like, if you want to be in my kingdom, that's the posture you need to approach me. Which is a heavy thing to say to grown-ups. But he doesn't stop there. Jesus goes on to say that whoever causes one of these little ones, not necessarily kids, though he's a big fan, whoever causes one of the humble, one of the ones who don't have it all figured together, one of the ones who are just reaching out in dependency for help, whoever causes one of those to stumble, it would be better for you, stumble causer, to tie a millstone around your neck and throw yourself into the sea. And I know you're new to this. You're like, well, Jesus didn't say that. Yeah, he did. If you block somebody from Jesus, the son of the living God who loves you with all his heart's like, this would be better. Trust me when I tell you, you do not want to get in the way of someone coming to faith in Christ. Are you? Are you through your words, whether spoken or digital, Are you through your actions, whether intentional or unintended, keeping somebody from Christ, blocking their view, so to speak? I say this in love. Jesus is angry about it. And it happens... It happens more often than you think. And I'll even give us a hall pass at Woodman just because it'll make it less awkward. But I've spoken to a lot of people and, and they will actually articulate. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not Jesus, the church per se, that bothers me. It's the people in it. Because being a sinner doesn't necessarily make you dumb, right? They can see the hypocrisy. They can, they, can, they can sense the judgment. They can know when they're not welcomed. They can feel the stares. And shame on us if it ever happens here. My prayer for not just the Easter season, but let's turn it up a notch if we need to. My prayer for our church is that we'd be a place that loves well. That no matter who they are or what they've done, if they step onto one of our campuses, they are welcomed. That they are brought to the edge of the parade. And yeah, They may not like Jesus when they meet him. But I don't want to get in the way of the introduction. You know what I'm saying? Do you? We are here to change lives. Look at verse 7. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord. The half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. Zacchaeus, the unlikely, 
came to saving faith in Jesus that day. Jesus said, today salvation has come to this house. And then somewhat quizzically, since he also is a son of Abraham. And I say somewhat quizzically because I'm not really sure how Jesus meant it. Obviously, we have the rest of the New Testament. The Apostle Paul would lay out there were to be, you know, there's physical descendants of Abraham, the father of, of the Jews. But, but then Paul's like, but there's actually also spiritual descendants of, of Abraham. Those are the ones who accepted Christ by faith. So I'm not sure if Jesus meant for us to read that much into it, but what is clear, Zacchaeus was saved that day. What is also clear, people were not happy about it. It's because the gospel is unpopular. Look at verse 7. It says, and when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Luke was, was a fan of like just putting people into big categories, which isn't always helpful. So all is probably hyper, hyperbole. But, but, but he's making a point. The, the crowd, the crowd started to mutter amongst themselves. And it's not just that they had tried to block Zach. They were upset when he got through. But notice in the text... Their main problem actually wasn't with Zacchaeus. Who was it with? Jesus. They were grumbling at him. They, who not long before were interested in seeing Jesus for themselves, had now had little interest when they recognized who Jesus wanted to see. If he eats with someone like him, I'm out. To be sure, it's not the idea of unmerited grace that's really unpopular. It's that some people think that unmerited grace should not be offered to those that they think are undeserving of it. Which I would contend is not to really recognize what unmerited grace means. That's the point. Nobody does. Do you realize that? Do you know that Jesus didn't have to die for you? but that he loved you. And it changes us. The gospel changes lives. Verse 8 says, And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, To say salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. If you're unfamiliar with the Christian thing, do not think for a moment that salvation came because Zacchaeus did all these things. Now, we've been offered a free gift of grace, and like Zach, we accept it. But while grace is free, it's not cheap. It changes people. Zacchaeus comes into a saving, transformative relationship with Christ, and it changes him recognizing what it is he's done, he stands up and immediately divests himself of half of his net worth. We're giving it to the poor because of you. And then, if I've defrauded anyone of anything, to which Jesus has not written, is like, and you have. Yes, I know. I'm just saying, I will restore it fourfold. This is remarkable, even by Old Testament standards. It's remarkable even by Jesus. This is a rich man who thread himself through the eye of a needle. He was changed. 
And it's really fascinating when you look at it. Zacchaeus stands up and addresses his comments to the Lord. But then Jesus responds by seemingly addressing his comments to the crowd. Jesus said to him, Zacchaeus, Today salvation has come to this house since he also is a son of Abraham. Because Jesus wanted the crowd to connect the dots if they could. There is a sobering reality that we need to come to grips with if we have not already. There will be people in heaven that we are surprised to see there. In Luke 14, Jesus was dining with some folk, right? Again, another meal. And one guy kind of shouts out in the meal like, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. He's kind of like, isn't this awesome? All of us awesome people doing awesome stuff with Jesus. This is going to be great forever. At which point Jesus responds to him, with his parable of the great banquet, essentially saying, you are going to be surprised at who's at the table with you. It will be outcast heavy. Conversely, though, there will be people missing from the kingdom of heaven that you thought for sure you would see there. Matthew 7, Jesus says, many are going to come on that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons, heal the sick, raise the dead? And Jesus is like, I'm sorry. I don't know you. Depart from me. As far as our text for this weekend is concerned, nobody thought Zacchaeus would get his ticket punched. But you know that Zacchaeus is in heaven today. And truly, I tell you, Jesus is still adding to the number those who will be. You may not find him in a tree, but they are all around us. And I want to share a story of some guys in our church. A story of some guys in our church who found one. Let's watch So, Ray, why don't you tell me how you came to know Austin and Joe? I met Austin um, several years ago. Um, I went on a bike ride. It was a group ride. And then, you know, um, you know, I called them up and I said, hey, you know, hey, Austin, you know, let's just keep riding. Uh, and then from there, you know, our, our adventure started, you know, I mean. We've been riding for seven years. One of us said, are you a Christian? And then from there on it, uh, through my indirect evangelism, it, it started to sprout. I just remember praying. I was like, God, just help me glorify you on this ride somehow. And here comes Ray pedaling up it. I'm a very introverted person. I'm an engineer. If it, Ray's not. And he's, <laughs> so he starts chatting me up. I'm like, man, who is this guy? You know. Next thing you know, he's like, bro, can I get your number, man? I'm like, sure. sure. All right. <laughs> and uh, so that's how I met Ray. Yeah, we enjoy mountain biking and, you know, we like the outdoors, but that is also a, a time to, you know, do some self-reflection. You know, you're you're with your buddy, you know, and you can really, you know, share your struggles and like, you know, share what's going on in your life. You know, and yeah, I grew up in a bad bad side of town, drive-bys, you know, and gangs, and you know, that's how I became. That's mm-hmm. what I became, right? Um, then I, you know, to get out of that, I joined the military. But then again, you know, I, I saw a lot of things, you know, and I picked up a lot of bad habits. And being a non-believer, there was no guidance. All these events and all these thoughts and all these, you know, drinking, you know, going to jail, right? You know, um, like I said, I got in trouble a lot, you know, because of the booze, the drugs. Mm-hmm. And those are the things that I shared with Austin and Joe, wow. you know, and they were never pushing. Yeah. They prayed for me, but they were never pushing that he's going to find his way. God, God is going to bring me. He's going to bring him in. I remember, Ray, you telling me that, like, you went from not caring if you lived another day 
to being like I got so much work to do and like I got so much more to do with life. Hmm. Yeah, I was you know just going through a, through some some rough times, you know. Um, and then you know I was in my office, mm. and um, you know I just felt uh, I felt a little bit sick. Mm. The addictions and the bad stuff that I was doing, you know, uh, being horrible to my spouse, you know, being a horrible dad, a horrible husband, a horrible friend, horrible son, you know, um, and, and all that stuff was just just tearing me apart. Yes, and and, and God, God's love was there. Mm. You know, you might not like it, but I'm gonna I'm gonna pull you away from that. We got a lot of work to do here, son. Mm. But it's different now. It, it, it's completely different. Yeah. You know, because because you know God, God is with me. Yeah. Wow. Praise God. Me and Ray started out just mountain biking, and it had become more than that. We would go on mountain bike trips, expecting to do miles and miles and rides and rides and we did but on the way we would listen to the sermon we talk about the word and brothers in Christ hold each other accountable so that day in the office it was a powerful moment because that that day that's that's when everything changed it was so motivating for me to see Ray just catch fire for the Lord and just and actually like make changes and really it just it started kind of you know casually talking about it starting out as mountain bike friends that just meet up and ride and leave and eventually where I was a part of his family and I'd always be a part of my family and I messaged Joe and I say hey you know uh, yeah. Austin you know Austin told me to, uh, to come to Woodman with him you know and, and, and meet, meet, you know meet a lot of great people and I think you enjoy it. bring your family having them come to church uh, go to Bible study uh, serving in the church and going to shows the church it's, it's been a blessing I'm excited for the for this 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 new chapter in my life, you know. I, I look forward to, you know, being a good husband, being a good dad. I'm just excited, you know, to uh, build build a, a relationship with with God, you know. I've never seen it. But I don't think in the back of Ray's high school yearbook, anyone wrote, most likely to follow after Jesus. But he's a follower of Christ today. We want to love well, change lives through Christ, because Jesus cares about this. And that's how it ends. Verse 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. This was Jesus' mission statement and his call upon us. And it wasn't passive. It was active. It was intentional. And I love how Joe said, I just prayed before going on a ride. Lord, would you let this, this, this mountain bike ride glorify you? Be like, Ray, ding. And it, it tells us not just what we are to do, but who it is we are looking for. The lost. Not those that think they have it all together. Not those who believe all that we think. But those who are separated from the God who made them through their sin. We are called to participate in that. And in the end of Matthew 28, Jesus says he is with us as we do. I want to leave you with two things. First, Zacchaeus responded immediately with haste and joy. It was his best day ever. And I wonder if today will be yours. I wonder if you've been interested in Jesus, but today realize that he's actually been looking for you. And I wonder if you will respond with haste and joy to him, confess him for who he is, believe that God raised him from the dead, and acknowledge you are who he tells you you are, lost and in need of his saving. And if you do that, come up and tell us. And welcome to the family. But second... 
I wonder if you and I will go looking for the one in the tree. In these weeks as we lead up to Easter, would you go looking for the one that you think would not be interested and call them to a relationship with Jesus? And this is maybe not the best thing to say, and I reserve the right to retract it, but I wonder if we take a page out of Jesus' playbook. And what if this Easter we just try it? Don't ask, just tell them. You must come to my house for dinner tonight. I have some things I want to tell you. You need to, you will come with me this Easter. I'm going to pray that Jesus changes lives through you as you love well for his glory's sake. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for Ray. I thank you for just the reminder that you are still about seeking and saving that which is lost. And I pray that we, your people, would take that to heart. Would we never block anyone from coming to you, but quite the contrary. Casting aside all that which divides us, would we fling wide open our doors to invite anyone interested to Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray, amen.
stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see you working Even when I don't feel it, you working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see you working Even when I don't feel it, you working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working And even when I don't see you working Even when I don't feel it, you working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, no Waymaker, miracle worker Promise keeper, light in the darkness My God, that is who you are oh, oh, oh. Waymaker, miracle worker Promise keeper, light in the darkness My God, that is who you are That is who you are That is who you are Oh, that is who you are That is who you are Oh, that is who you are Yes, that is That is who you are That is who you are That is who you are You are way maker, miracle worker Promise keep light in the darkness My God, that is who Thank you for joining us today. And as you go into your week, go with this blessing. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.